Okay, welcome back to Song of Songs. This is uh, still chapter 7, and uh, we're moving on to verse 5. And it, uh, in the NAS, it says, Your head crowns you like caramel, and the flowing locks of your head are like purple threads. And then it says, The king is captivated by your tresses. In other words, uh, the tresses of her hair. With that Romans chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, her head like caramel. In other words, it's set high above the world. So her head is in heavenly places, just like Mount Carmel. It sits high above the plains and high above the other mountains. It's interesting, too, that Mount Carmel is crowned in glory. So it has a beautiful snow white uh, snows that crown it and then water the land and cause the, the crops to come up and all the valleys around it because of the rivers that come off of the snow. She's crowned in glory. Her head is above the earth. It's, uh, it's above the other mountains. Her mind is in heavenly places. Have you ever heard the term, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good? You know, it's interesting. So much of the church has taken that to mean don't be heavenly minded. That's how they take it. Don't be heavenly minded. Just be worthy of the earth. So in other words, don't be Mary, be Martha. That's what the church says. Jesus said that Mary has chose the better thing. She was being heavenly minded. She was thinking about Jesus. She was listening to his words. She was thinking and contemplating what he was saying to her. Martha was over there washing dishes and getting madder and madder every minute, watching her sister sitting at his feet and not helping. Until she couldn't stand it anymore, she cried out, Lord, make Mary get up and help me make dinner. And the Lord said, Martha, she's chosen the better thing. She's getting her soul fed. She's getting her soul fed. The bride's head is in the top of the mountains. It's heavenly minded. You see, if you're fully heavenly minded, and honestly so, you will be earthly good. Because if you're heavenly minded, you will take on the very heart of Christ for people. And then when you are dealing with people, you'll have the heart and mind of Christ for them. And you'll have things that you can share with them to bring them up to a higher place. Don't believe that lie. Don't be so heavenly minded you're no earthly good. No. Be heavenly minded fully. Then you'll be earthly good. Amen. It's interesting. It says, the flowing locks of your head are like purple threads. Her hair is like purple threads. It's interesting, if you study the tabernacle in the wilderness, the tabernacle of Moses, you find that the outer door into the holy place was made up of three colors. It was made up of royal blue. It was made up of purple. It was made up of red. The royal blue represents the heavenly or the Father. The red represents mankind, Christ, the second Adam, Adam, blood in the face. The purple represents a mixture of the royal blue and the blood. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. The royal blue, the Father, is fully within the Son. Did you know that's where the kings of England got the idea of uh, purple robes? And that's a king's robe because they claimed that they were the actual descendants of Christ. They'd say that's where their royalty came from. Isn't that amazing? They say Jesus actually had children through, Martha, through uh, 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 Mary and that their descendants became the kings of, of, uh, of Europe. And that's why if you have king's blood or royal blood, you've heard the royal blood, they literally say that is genetically royal blood back to Jesus. But you test that blood, it's not Jewish. <laughs> Jesus was a Jew. So was Mary. 
and he didn't have children. He was a type of Melchizedek. He had no genealogy, no one to follow after him. He was the end of that line. Purple is a mixture of the red and the blue. She has these beautiful locks of purple within her locks showing her head is Christ. That's why it's purple. Her hair represents her submission. She is submitted to Christ, the Son of God, who is filled with the very presence of the Father, the royal blue, and he's totally human, the red, and it makes purple. Her locks are beautiful in purple, showing her locks, submission, the color who she submitted to. She submitted fully to Christ. She is not Laodicea. Laodicea means the rule of the laity. Why, well, I'm going to tell you which way we're going to go. Yeah, I'm steering the boat. Why, well, I was deceived once before in another church and the Lord led me the wrong way. I'm never going to be deceived again. I'm never going to give Jesus a chance to deceive me again or allow me to be deceived. He could have stopped and he didn't. I got deceived. Listen, we get deceived on our own. That's not the Lord's doing. That's ours. If we ignore the clear word of God, we can be deceived. If we don't follow the precepts the Lord has given us, we can be deceived. If we're following after man's traditions, we can be deceived. It's not the Lord's fault. He gives us a lot of warning to keep us out of deception. It's our fault if we don't uh, yield to it. We have to yield to those warnings. Laodicea is not submitted, but the bride of Christ is submitted. Who is she submitted to? To Christ. And Christ alone. She submitted to Jesus alone. She is not submitted to the world. She's not submitted to the church traditions. She is not submitted to a man. She's submitted to Christ. And if she hears Jesus being spoken through the pastor, she'll submit because it's Christ. But if she goes, I'll decide my own way, that's Laodicea. Her hair's cut off. Because she's not in submission to Christ. She's in submission to self. She's in submission to self. That's Laodicea. That's Laodicea. Oh, Lord, deliver us from Laodicea. Deliver me from Laodicea. I want every bit, every little last scrap of the leaven of Laodicea out of my house. Every scrap out of my house. I don't want anything left. The king is captivated by your tresses. Her, the tresses of her long, beautiful hair has just got his attention because he's seen. She's fully submitted. I want to tell you a truth, and I want you all to hear me. I want everybody to hear this very well. Your outward appearance reveals what's going on inside your heart. It reveals who you're submitted to. It reveals your attitude. It reveals the spirit you are of. And according to that, it also will reveal uh, uh, to the angelic, demonic realm what inroads they have with you. The scripture, Paul talks about a woman having long hair, and she needs to have that because of the messengers. The word messengers, it's angels or demons, spiritual realm. Because her long hair is a symbol of her submission, her heart of submission. And if she cuts it off, that submission is gone and it's an outward symbol that demons and angels look at and they go, she's open. Either to an angel or to a demon. It's the same thing with a man. A man gets his, wears his hair long, what's his attitude usually? Rebellion. He's not submissive to anybody. He wants to, to, uh, he wants to uh, kick against everything, every law, everybody around him. Why? Because he's full of rebellion. And so a demon sees that and goes, a demon of rebellion, I'm going to help him out. I'm going to go down there because he's open to me. I can see it on his flesh. So the Lord is saying this. He's saying, her tresses have captivated him because by those he looks at her and he goes, she's submitted. And she submitted just to me. And he grabs his heart. He grabs his heart and he just goes, 
I, I love her. I want her. I can, I can manifest straight through her because she's submitted. She's yielding only to me. There's not a mixture in that hair. Oh, look, there's a strand of, of Baptist. There's a strand of Pentecostal. There's a strand of Catholicism. Listen, that is common today. There was a sister that when she came into the truth of the ages, dear sweet sister, if you're watching this, I miss you. She has the most incredible testimony, one of the most spiritual women I've ever known. Very, very spiritual lady. And when she came in the truth of the ages, the Lord instantly started casting out demons out of her, right here in this church. And afterwards, she gave the testimony. She said, the Lord cast 50 spirits out of me. Now, this woman had been around and been through a lot of different moves of God for years and years and years. How was it 50 spirits needed to be cast out of a woman that uh, was moving in such wonderful places in God? They were the little foxes that had come in to ruin the vine over the years. And she started naming them. There was a spirit of Pentecostalism. There was a spirit of religiosity. There was a spirit of prayer warrior. Hey, demons will come and, and, and try to trick us into anything. They've been doing it to us since we were children. And so when, they, when these things are getting cast out right and left, she didn't know who she was hardly anymore. But the Lord revealed to her real quick. And she started a deeper, higher relationship in Jesus that from that day on. And she had a lot to learn and a lot to walk in. Because when you come into the knowledge of the ages, it changes everything. I told Brother Mark years ago, years and years ago, when he first came in to the knowledge of the ages, I said, Mark, watch out. This is going to change your life. This is going to change everything. Yeah. It took him a little while to realize that one day he calls me up and he says, Jim, this changes everything. <laughs> I just said, amen. <laughs> exactly, it does. And see, as she came into it, the Lord said, now you're ready to get rid of these 50 spirits. And I am just proud of this, dear sister. I mean, and it's also a testimony to me because I need to get rid of these things too. I want them out. I don't want any leaven in me. She got rid of 50. I might have to get rid of 100 or 150. I don't care. Whatever the Lord wants, whatever the Lord reveals, I'm willing because I want all the leaven out, every last speck. Okay, going on, verse 6. He says, How beautiful and how delightful you are, my love, with all your charms. It's interesting, in, um, in um, the literal, in this verse, it says, How beautiful and how delightful you are, my love, with all your charms. Literally, here's what it says. How beautiful and how delightful you are, love, or excuse me, with love among your delights. So he's saying, literally, he's saying, how beautiful and how delightful you are, with love among your delights. Isn't that interesting? So what he's emphasizing here is, it is her love above everything else. All her other attributes. It is the love of God through her and her love mixed with it that is the best of all her delights. The love is the best. It's the topping of all things. Her crowning glory is the love of God. Her crowning glory is the love of God manifested through her. Now she has all these other wonderful mature attributes. Her submission, her heart, you know, her, her, her love, her compassion, her willingness to, to raise the newborn, her works, in other words. But her crowning glory is her love. And I want to talk about this more, but I need to on the next 
on the next video. Lord bless you. I'll see you at the next video.